Right, okay. So just to say then, uh, welcome back any everyone. <clears throat> it's really good to see you all. And um, I feel the these local environmental record centers training sessions are going well. Um, and uh, we've got loads of enthusiasm and the fact you've come back this week is, is a good sign. So that's really good. So today uh, we will have a little bit of repetition from last week because I don't think that does any harm. Um, but going into more depth of the big eight, so we will look at the workers and the males as well as the queens. And we'll look a little bit more detail uh, of, of the cuckoos, though being mindful that they're still very difficult. And uh, I think that'll warrant a whole little session on its own, probably at a later date. I've managed to slot your photographs into the presentation, um, even the ones that, that came quite late today. So thanks for getting them to me. And uh, I haven't put names against any of them. There's a real mix of um, correct IDs and IDs that have got a bit muddled up, but that's fine. That's absolutely brilliant because it just enables us all to, to learn and discuss the different sort of features that we see. And then after break, Elaine and I will do a bit more on the practicalities of recording and being out in the field and using the Lurk Wales app, etc. Okay. I, so I, had a, I had a picture, um, but it was, a, it was a fly. Did you send it to me, Grant? I didn't see no, that one. No, because it wasn't a bee. Right, okay. Yeah, no, okay. that's fine. That's fine. Um, but it looked like a bee. <laughs> well, you should have sent it because we could have stuffed it in. Yeah, I, no. I think I think that's um, you know that's all part of the learning, really. But yeah, don't worry. Yeah, it was a fleet. It was a fly disguised as a bee, and it um, it lays its eggs in the in the bee's nest. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, was it bomb, um, the bee fly, Bombilius major? Yeah, maybe. That's yeah. The boy. Nice one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to um, just be really cheeky and ask you all to mute and then um, we'll stop before tea, we'll have a conf lab and also when we're looking at some of the pictures, I'll get you to turn your mics off uh, and, and, and just yell out if you have any thoughts. So uh, back to last week, um, you've seen this slide before. So and from your emails, I can see everybody's, you know, beginning to use that sort of suite of clues and yeah it, it stays with you that I still use that suite of clues when I am faced with um, something that's quite tricky so keep those in your mind with tail colour being your initial oh tail colour being your initial um, sort of start of a turn if you like and same as last week again we kind of lead on tail colour, though sometimes we have to be flexible with the two pairs on the left half of the screen being effectively what we call the white tail bumblebees. And then the two red tails and the two gingery ones. But this time, like I said, we're, we are going to look um, at all three casts. So on this diagram, obviously, if all three casts are identical, apart from in Heath Bumblebee, they put all three on, looking the same. But in the Garden Bumblebee, you won't, the queen worker and male are all like that. And then in the buff tail, the queen has her buff bottom. The worker and male look almost identical. In the white tail, the queen and worker look almost identical, but the male is different. So that's indicated in the, in the diagrammatic representation of that species. And then I've just talked about those two. But the red tails, the early bumblebee with a little tiny bit of red on the bottom. It says here the queen and worker look like that. But if you remember, the worker, 
often lacks the second yellow band and the male is much more yellow, much, much more yellow with a very yellow face. And in the red tail, the queen and worker are the same. The male is different with the red band behind the head and a yellow face. Also has a tiny bit of yellow on the back of the thorax. But in the tree bumblebee and the card bumblebee, all three casts are the same color pattern. So we use other clues to distinguish the cast. Okay. Right, so here are some um, attendee photographs. They're not all from this group actually, but I've included some of them because they're really useful. So this was from one of the other local record centre groups and they weren't sure, they thought this could be a common carder. Um, does anybody know what that is? Oh, first of all, okay, let's go back a step. Is it a bumblebee? Check, put it in the chat or I'm quite happy for people to shout out. Monica's asked if it's Andrina, which is one of the solitary mining bees. Is it a bumblebee? We've had yes, no, no. Or honeybee possibly from Monica. Okay, no. Well, I'll tell you, eyes a bit large for a bee from Jeff. Well, that's actually, yeah, they are quite big. <laughs> eyes too big from Rachel as well. So yeah, you're thinking back to when I said about the, the hoverfly eyes are very, very big. But these eyes do appear big on this um, specimen, but they are still lateral. They're still on the side of the head with a gap in the middle. So it is a bee. Okay, it is a bee. Uh, it's actually a type of solitary bee. It isn't a honeybee or a bumblebee because a honeybee and a bumblebee doesn't have a pale colored face like that. Because if you look at that, if you zoomed in on it, you'd see it's not the hairs that are pale, but it's the actual integument, the actual outer skin of the bee. And if you remember, I said bumblebees are all black underneath. Underneath the hairs, they're all black. So you never get a bumblebee with a pale, creamy face like that. And this is actually um, a male hairy, it's not a mason bee, it's a male hairy footed flower bee. Okay, so beautiful image, gorgeous type of bee, uh, Anthrophor Anthophora plumapes is the Latin name, but not a bumblebee with that pale, pale face. Anyone know what that one is? I better not spend too long on these. Um, just quickly, anyone? Quick, quick answer on that one. I'll give you clues. <laughs> Tawny singing bee. Common carder. Yes, it does look a bit like a common carder, Rachel. It really, really does. Um, but it's not. You'd never get a common carder all tawny like that. But it does look quite bumblebee-ish. It's Andrea. Yeah, thank you. It's a tawny mining bee, Andrina fulva. And it's one of the most bumblebee-like of the solitary bees. Okay, so Andrina fulva, tawny mining bee, stunning bee. And it's from, from head to tail, it's this tawny red colour. You don't get any bumbles that look like that. And this is why I've put these in, uh, even though they're from a different group, because they're good to... Um, and this one looks very bumbly, but it's actually a female hairy footed flower bee. And she's all black, really rounded, like a bit like a bumblebee, but she has these orange haired back legs. Okay, bright orange haired back legs, which you'd never get in a bumblebee. So that's a hairy footed flower bee, female. And that, I think is off one of you. And that is a mining bee, but I'm not sure which one. 
because it's quite an old raggedy specimen, it's gone bald. It could be Andrina scotica, very, very faded. The chocolate mining bee, but I'm actually not sure. But it's that the person who sent it said not a bumblebee and they were correct. It's not a bumblebee, it's a solitary bee. That's another solitary, that's an ashy mining bee. I'm gonna skip over that one. And we're going to get on to the bumbles. So good. That's really useful looking at some solid trees. Okay, so let me just close down the chat. Right. So common gingery bumblebees. We'll start with Bombus pascorum, the common carder. It is all ginger, all three casts of gingery. They often have quite extensive black hairs on the abdomen and a creamy underneath. You can see on this specimen, I think this is probably a male looking at the antennae and the back legs. But you can see they have creamy color on the side, gingery thorax, and the abdomen, abdomen can be anything from bright blonde to really quite dark and appears quite stripy with a black abdominal hairs. So typical common card of that one, but they do vary. All three casts are similar. That one's nice and bright and you can really see the black hairs on that one. That looks like a female. And that one again, very similar. Okay, so Bombus pascorum, the common carder. And one of the courses we do hopefully with Subrac, but it will be either later in the year or next year, will be an introduction to the, to the Carder bumblebees because they're really hard to tell apart. So that's a more intermediate level. And these are often quite late emerging and they often persist right late into the summer. As long as there's forage, I've, I've seen them foraging well into September. Okay, as long as there's stuff around for them to, to be eating. So here are some of your pictures. And I did wonder if this one was labeled wrong, because I'm sure um, most of you can see that isn't a common carder. That is a red-tailed bumblebee. Although I have to say, sometimes common carders can appear very reddish on the abdomen, but nothing like this. Okay, so that's a red-tailed bumblebee. Nice picture. Okay. And this one, I think everyone would agree. Don't be afraid to put something in the chat if you've got any thoughts or questions about these. Definite common card here, feeding on um, uh, pulmonaria, I think, isn't it? Lungwort. So, gingery thorax, black and ginger abdomen, no white tail. And I'm almost certain this is a female because she's got little upright short antennae there. Can't quite see the pollen baskets, but I can see the antennae. So I would say common carder could be a queen, could be a worker. Can't tell from that picture, really. And these two are from uh, this group. So yes, this one appears quite dark, but I'm fairly sure that's common carder. And this one appears very pale. And this person asks, could it be a brown banded carder? And I would say almost certainly not. I would ha have to zoom in. Well, I don't think you could even zoom in to see enough of the abdomen to tell, but it is extremely difficult to tell brown banded carders from common card is from a photograph and this one is actually quite faded and we can't see enough of the bee to get enough clues so I'd say probably not but we just don't know so you wouldn't be able to make a record from that photograph 
because you can't, really can't tell which card that is. Okay. And this one, yes, definitely common carda, gingery thorax and black hairs, I can see on the abdomen um, and all gingery, no white tail. So good, that one was correct. And these are both from this group. And yes, definitely common card is, this one definitely looks like a female. Um, very short little elbow antennae there. Um, and this one as well, I think. Female workers, probably. But difficult to tell the workers from the queens from a photograph of this species because um, they are appear so similar in colour and it's difficult to get a sort of size, a judgment on size. So I wouldn't judge the cast on those photographs. I haven't seen uh, any common card workers yet, because they are a bit later emerging, but I don't think we've got enough information there. Okay, hopefully everybody's happy with those. So we'll move on to the other ginger, uh, gingery bumblebee, but also a white tail bumblebee, the tree bumblebee, uh, Bombus hypnorum, and it's one of our most distinctive species, though it does throw a few anomalies at us. So all, all casts, the work, queen and worker, and the males all look very similar. The queens can be absolutely huge in this species, but they do vary in size depending on their nutrition uh, that they received when they were in the nest the year before. Workers can vary massively from being absolutely teeny tiny to being almost as big as the queens. The males are slightly more consistent in size. Um, they all have the same color and it, this is the typical tree bumblebee beautiful tawny thorax. So like the tawny mining bee, the solitary bee, I showed you similar-ish color, but in the tawny mining bee, obviously the entire bee is that color. And in the tree bumblebee, you've got this black abdomen with a distinctive white tail, snowy white. But we do get melanic forms like this one, and by melanic, I mean that uh, a lot of the pigment here is black rather than uh, tawny red. So in this particular individual, you can see that the thorax is black haired. There's a teeny tiny bit of rusty red at the back of the thorax, and then the white tail, which isn't as distinct as in the queen. So uh, that looks like a worker. So the melanic forms are scarce, but I wouldn't say they were rare. And we have had one sent in from this group, which is great. They love nesting in the uh, buildings and nest boxes. So tree bumblebee, it, although this photo is obviously blurred, it could not be anything else. Bright uh, tawny thorax, black and white tail. So yes, and that one is, oh, that's so gorgeous, that photograph. Uh, we can absolutely tell this is, um, well, I'm gonna stick my neck out, the same as the person who took this photograph and say tree bumblebee worker. Can anyone tell me why that is almost certainly a worker as opposed to a male or a queen? Any, anyone, anyone brave enough? Pop it in the chat. If you can see any clues as to why that would be, well, first of all, why it would be a female, but why this is most likely to be a worker. Just having a look in the chat. Pollen, Scott pollen, net, 
Yeah, it's pollen on legs. Um, oops, I've lost the chat. Pollen basket, yeah, good. So if you look there, that white blob on her hind leg there, that's uh, pollen, white pollen that she's collected and stuck on her back leg. The reason I think it's a worker rather than the queen is that the cotoniaster has very small flowers and leaves. So she looks quite small to me. So I'm gonna go work her. And if you look on the back of her thorax, here's a little tip. She's going bald and that's where she's going in and out of the nest all the time. And you see, see that most often on workers. You do see it on queens sometimes, but most often on workers. So yeah, I agree with uh, whoever sent that in. Oh, right, okay. And here we've got um, a melanic tree bumblebee. And uh, the person who sent this in got that, so that's brilliant. So this tree bumblebee is, the thorax is almost entirely black instead of tawny red. Tiny little tuft of red at the back or ginger as we should say, black abdomen, white tail. And it's a female for sure, because the pollen basket there is really obvious. Um, anyone want to tell me what this one is in the background? I'll pop it in the chat. Be. Yeah, who is that? Is that me? I don't know who that is, I can't see you. It was Andy. Yeah, Andy, yeah. Sorry, I thought it was on mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you got it right. So it's fine. Everybody's saying honeybee, so that's brilliant. Yeah, it's a honeybee. Oh, and Andy, you're a beekeeper, aren't you? So if you didn't know that, we, we wouldn't be very happy with you at all. Um, yeah, honeybee there. So that's really great, great image to compare the two. Um, yeah, okay, right. Okay, so those were the two gingeries. So let's move on to the common species which we categorize as having red tailed, red tails. And we've got the early bumblebee, Bombus praetorum, and the red tailed bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius. Okay, so I'll do the early bumblebee first. So the queen is uh, one of my favorite. Uh, queen bumblebees, very, very attractive, and one of the first species to emerge in the spring. The tail colour in this species is not extensive, it's only on the very, very tip of the abdomen. The queens have two yellow brands, really bright, not sort of that marmalade colour like in a buff tail, they're brighter with a little orange um, tip to the tail, orangey red. But the workers are quite annoying and they're often misidentified, like so often misidentified. They lack that second abdominal band, so they're slightly different to their mothers. Fluffy, fluffy species, this one. And the little tip on the workers is often um, almost impossible to see, actually, in the field. The male's probably one of my favourite male bumblebees. Really fluffy, really super cute, I think. Loads and loads of yellow. They were almost like they're wearing a yellow ruff. Very yellow haired face and a big yellow stripe on the abdomen and then their orangey red tail. So very pretty species, the early bumblebee. And they're the smallest UK bumblebee. Okay, generally speaking. So I had this one sent in to me. Um, unknown. Any thoughts on identifying that from the photograph? Does anyone want does anyone want to uh, put something in the chat or what 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 are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts? Have a look at it. Any thoughts? You know, if somebody gave you that photograph to identify, 
what would you say to them? That it's a male, okay. Um, I'm not sure about that. Anyone else? Well, the one where the male has no second band. Okay, well, it's, it's the worker. Let me go, it's quite thin, so not a queen. Mm, possibly, I'm not sure from that picture. Early worker. Yeah, so, well, I'm not saying yes, it is. I'm saying yes, that's a good suggestion because we can see it has a yellow band there behind the head and there's definitely no second yellow band on the sore, on the abdomen, on the abdomen, like in some early workers. So that's a possible. But occasionally, I can't, I can't see any shiny leg baskets there because the shiny leg baskets are on the back legs. So I can't see the back legs. I can't see the antennae enough. And occasionally other species will lack a second abdominal band. And there is a cuckoo. Remember what I said, the cuckoos often have a collar, but no abdominal band. So I think actually the best you can say on this is we don't know. It's just not enough information. Can't see the tail, can't see the back legs, can't see the abdomen clearly. So we could make a guess at an early bumblebee worker, but we don't know. So very often, if you've exhausted all your clues and they're just not obvious, then we don't know. OK, and remember, we can't see the pollen baskets on front legs, only on back. And I, there's just not enough visible to see. All right. So suggested early bumblebee. Any thoughts on that one? Look at the tail colour. Look at the tail colour and the number of bands. Yeah, okay. Well, it can't be an early bumblebee because it's not got a reddy orange tail. It's got a white tail. So I've got um, lots of people saying buff tail and it's almost certainly a buff tail. All right, I would record that as a buff tail because it's got these deep marmalade colour bands and I can just see a sort of buff edge to the tail there. So well done. And this has got to be my favourite photo of the evening. I'd love to tweet this one actually tomorrow if the photographer doesn't mind. Mark, a beautiful image of one of my favourite bees. And um, it was suggested it was an early bumblebee male. Uh, if we look, the biggest clue is the yellow hairs on the face. So yes, definitely a male. Orangey red tail, massive yellow collar, super fluffy. Correct. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant image of uh, absolute cutie. I'm going to whiz at you. This was from a different group but the suggested ID was early bumblebee worker, yellow collar, ready orange tail, no second yellow band. Yes, correct. And it can't be anything else because um, the male would have a yellow abdominal band. Oops, sorry, there. And for this one, we had suggested ID early bumblebee worker. Yep. Ready orange tail, so that's my first port of call. I can see it's a female uh, with a pollen basket. I can just see the yellow collar, no second yellow abdominal band. I can, I've also got scale on this one because I know how big a perennial cornflower is. So that is quite a small bee. So good, yes, correct. And that one oh no that one they said red tail bumblebee male but it's actually 
an early bumblebee worker because a red-tailed bumblebee male would have more yellow on the thorax and it would have more red on the abdomen. It would have a much more extensively red tail. So that's an early bumblebee worker. Sorry, I should have given you a chance to mull over that one. Okay, so we've had loads of photographs. So we'll move on to the other red tail bumblebee now, the Bombus lapidarius, the red tail. And it's generally bigger than the early bumblebee. Um, and the red is much more extensive, sort of not quite up to half, but just below half of the abdomen. And the queens and workers are the same, although the queens are bigger. So quite stunning species. The males are different with their straight away, you know, yellow face, male. And then they have two yellow bands on the thorax and a um, nice extensively red tail, more extensive than in the early bumblebee. And there's another male there. Okay. So yellow face male, yellow hairs on the face. Don't worry about that last bullet point. We'll, we'll come to that another time about the pairs on the pollen baskets. That's to separate it from the rare, rare species that look similar. And a real top tip for this one is that those lovely bright colors do fade in the sun. And by the end of the summer, red tail bumblebees are often bleached out and they almost look black and silver. Even the tails of the females can become really, really bleached. So they go to like pale red and then they'll go to a yellow and the males can look really silvery. So beware of that this season. As the summer goes on, um, they will bleach out and the males in particular because they don't go back to the nest. So they're outside all of the time. If you have a lot of hot days, they bleach very quickly. It's a real pain actually. <laughs> And that's a lot of red tails uh, that were sent in, um, but actually by other groups. And I didn't have many from all of this group, apart from this fantastic image. And um, a question if it was a bilberry bumblebee. I think this is actually a male red tail because it's got the yellow hairs on the face and um, Bilberry Bumblebee would have a little bit more yellow and it, the, the tail goes up um, at least another segment from that. So the red on the tail is even more extensive in the Bilberry Bumblebee, but I do agree it, it does look very striking and very, very easy to mix up. Okay, but you can see very clearly it's a male there and you can see it's hairy back legs and it's long antennae. Beautiful, beautiful image. Okay, so we're halfway through, bear with me folks, halfway through the first bit. <laughs> Common white tail bumblebees now with two yellow bands. So we've got the white tail and the buff tail. I would say the buff tail in gardens, et cetera, is far more commonly seen, but they are both widespread pretty much all over the UK. Okay. In Pembrokeshire, I certainly see buff tails more in my garden than I do white tails. So we'll start with the buff tail. And as we've already said, the queen is really distinctive in that she's big very low pitched buzz in the buff tail and she um, comes out quite early in the spring. I would say this diagram doesn't show that her stripes are generally quite deeply pigmented yellow and then her tail is always buff in the queen. It's always off white and that's a typical queen buff tail. Uh, those beautiful deep marmalade stripes and in that one, the buff of the tail almost looks as dark as her stripes. Okay, so she's very distinctive. But the workers and the males are white tailed and they look really, really similar. These two are tricky 
So they're both white tailed and they both have two yellow bands in the same position. The workers vary in size from being tiny to being as big as the males. So it's really tricky to tell them apart. So that's a typical buff tail worker. Two yellow stripes, okay, one behind the head, one slightly low on the abdomen, and then a white tail. And that's a male. <laughs> they look really similar. So you're totally reliant on looking at the antennae and the back legs. But the back femur here where the pollen basket is in these males is actually quite broad and it can be tricky to tell. All right, so you really have to practice um, with these to be able to tell the males and females apart. Queens are easy, workers and males not so much. Also, the buff tailed bumblebee, both the males and the workers, often have a thin yellow band at the top of the tail where the black meets the white. And this can be really important in distinguishing them from the next species we're gonna look at. It's not always there, that's the trouble, but it is sometimes. So it, to key in on buff tail workers and males, look for that yellow band but don't rely on it. Okay. So I often get these species, um, I often get people mixing these species up and asking me if something like this is a buff-tailed bee. Any, any thoughts on that? Anyone wanna weigh in in the... Um, in the, in the chat on what they think that one might be. Okay. So it's got a, it's actually, I know this looks a bit like a buff tail, but it's actually a reddish tail. Yeah, got a couple of people saying early um, it's not a male red tail because it's got yellow on the abdomen and the male red tail only has it two bands on the thorax and also the red isn't quite extensive enough but so easy to mix that up. Okay I'm fairly certain this is an early bumblebee worker with a faded abdominal band You're there, a yellow one, because it's got a little red peachy bottom, yellow collar and, a, and an indistinct yellow on the abdomen. So I think that's an early bumblebee worker, but, but easy to get that mixed up. Oh, come on computer, there we are. Um, It isn't a buff tail because the tail is just too red. And on that perennial cornflower, that's, that's not a big bumblebee. So if it was a buff tail worker, this tail would be white, okay? And it can't be a buff tail queen because it's too small and it would have more distinct stripes. So it can't be a worker because this is too red. I can't be a buff tail worker because it's too red and it can't be, um, and it's too small to be a queen. I, I hope that answers you, Rachel. But loads of people get that wrong. Right, this one's a bit blurdy. But whoever's sent that in has said, is it a white tail or a buff tail? Um, or it could be either, I guess they're asking. And, and yeah, I, I'm thinking this is a buff tail because 
the stripes look quite dark yellow and I think I can see a yellow abdominal band there but um, not a yellow abdominal band sorry yellow interface at the top of the tail but I, the photo just isn't good enough so I think it's a buff tail but I would record it as a white stroke buff tail because it's just not enough information not clear enough I'm sure it's a female though, because those antennae look very female. Buff tail bumblebee, somebody's asked for that one. Certainly is, buff tail. Nice deep pigmented, lovely stripes. And I would say that's almost certainly a queen with that buff colored tail. Okay, so um, I hope that was all right for everyone. And over that one a bit quick. So moving on to Bombus leucorum, the kind of, all, I almost think of it as a sister species, um, which is wildly inaccurate scientifically, but so similar to the buff tail in, in some respects. So I sort of group them together in my mind. So the white tail, the queens are relatively large and they have lemony yellow stripes. They tend to be much brighter than the buff tail with a snowy white bottom. And the workers are like little uh, miniatures of their mothers. But the males are distinctly different with a lot of yellow. The amount extent varies, but they're almost like the archetype of yellow and stripe, black stripe bumblebee with lots of yellow on the thorax and the abdomen. So the queens and workers look like this. That is a queen. And the males are, often look extremely yellow, strikingly yellow. So any bumblebee you see with a white tail and lots and lots of yellow like this, a yellow ruff, yellow haired face, yellow on the abdomen, yellow at the back of the thorax is a white tailed male. Okay, and the tails are always snowy white without the yellow band. So top tip here, workers are almost impossible to separate from buff tail workers in the field because they both have white tails. So if we, if we go back a slide, oh, a couple of slides, that's a pain. If we go back to there, buff tails, you can tell the queens apart, the buff and white tails, because the white tails have a snowy white bottom. You can tell the males apart because the males in the white tail have a lot more white, uh, yellow, but you can't tell the workers of these two species apart very easily at all. Okay, the workers are very similar, apart from some buff tails have a yellow stripe there at the top of the tail. I know that's confusing, and that's where field days do help. So again, not a great image. This has been put forward as a white tail bumblebee and yeah, I can see a yellow collar, I can see a second yellow stripe and I can see a white tail. But we can only put buff or white tail worker. And actually I shouldn't put worker in there because we don't know that that's not a white tailed queen. Can't be a buff tail queen because the tail's too white, but yeah, not enough information in that image really to record it. Some, so white tail bumblebee worker. Anyone wanna throw anything into the chat on that one? What are your thoughts? So there's a, quite a few clues in that picture, both to possible species and cast. Female Hannah, yes. Why do you say female? That's, I'll throw back at you, are right. Could be a queen, I suppose. Female with pollen, Rachel, yes. 
definitely. Yellow band at tail tips, so buff tailed worker, nice one, cat. Maybe a yellow band above the white tail, yeah. Buff tail worker, Rachel, yeah. I'm leaning towards buff tail worker because I can see a yellow band there. I'd still be tempted to call it as a white, buff white worker because it's so difficult to separate and it is a bit of a blurry image. So I would still record it as one of the two, but you know, I'd wanna see that specimen to check that interface, but it looks like a buff tail superficially. All right, but always err on the side of caution with your recording. And the same on that one, can't be sure. One of the two. Okay, okay, I hope, sorry, I was whizzed past that one. Okay, last two now, folks. We're nearly there. So common white-tailed species with three yellow bands. And there are two of these, the garden bumblebee and the heath bumblebee. They have exactly the same pattern and all casts are the same in both species. They have several distinguishing features. The garden bumblebee is um, a lot more widespread than the heath bumblebee because the heath bumblebee does tend to be restricted in habitat to where there uh, is heathland, as you'd expect, heather. They like feeding on, on heather species. So that's useful. Garden bumblebee, as the name suggests, um, is really common in gardens. So this is more likely to be the one you'll see. And the most distinguishing feature is their face, which in the garden bumblebee um, is long and horsey looking. And in the... Um, Heath bumblebee, it's round, it's sort of more heart shaped, really. It's more, you know, more sort of circular than, than a lot, than elongate. And the, the garden bumblebee itself is an elongated species and it's quite large compared to the heath. So garden bumblebee, elongate species, all three casts have this pattern, one, two, three yellow bands, two on the thorax, and one meeting there at the waist in the middle on the abdomen and a lovely white tail. That is a particularly spectacular queen. She is absolutely beautiful and they can be really big again in this species. See a lovely pollen basket there, shining. And there's their long horsey face. That is also a queen. They have a very long tongue, so can often be seen foraging on the deepest flowers like monkshood and um, foxgloves and things like that. Okay, so, and the males look very, very similar. I, should, I need a picture of a male here, actually. I, I rarely see males of this species, but um, yeah, often, often see queens and workers in the spring. The workers are out now, so one, one definitely to look out for in your gardens. Um, and we have had some uh, pictures in, not, not a great shot because this was a very busy bee, looks to me like she's looking for a nest site, uh, buzzing round in the grass there, but you can clearly see the three stripes, even though it looks like two at a glance, there are two there in the middle, one on the thorax, one on the abdomen, and then the collar, so three stripes, white tail, and you can even get a kind of feel for a long face there, but yeah, almost certainly a, a garden bumblebee queen. So that's good. But using behavior there a bit as well. Here's another one, garden bumblebee. So we can't, we can't see the face, but I can see, I can see a pollen basket there. And one, two, three yellow stripes, a little bit faded, and a white bottom. And you can also you can also see the tip of this one's abdomen, which can be a clue. It's quite pointed. 
So uh, the females have a more pointy abdomen. So yes, that one was correct. I forgot to put the answer on. Um, this one, what do you think this one is? So tail colour, this is the guess. Somebody has put um, garden bumblebee female. Um, any suggestions on male or female for that one? For a start. And you can see something that's very obviously telling us that it's, um, well, what sex it is. Male, yes, yellow face. Well, yellow face. So it's a male. And a male of which species? Cat, early male. Yeah, male, early male, brilliant. It's an early male. Tons of yellow around its collar, like a little Elizabethan ruff there. Lots of yellow on the abdomen at the top and a little peachy bottom. So, uh, yeah, you're right. Who's that? Hannah, you're right. The antennae are really long, aren't they? You can see, see the segments there. So good, good, brilliant. And the last one, we're nearly there. We're nearly there, folks. And um, I've talked an awful lot here. Right, Heath Bumblebee. So, uh, as I said, three yellow bands, white tail, round face. Probably my favourite bumblebee species, actually. Um, so, all the same colour. There's a typical Bombus genellus. We really should have a photograph of that little round face. So, I think I've got one of the male, actually. So... One, two, three yellow stripes, very fluffy, very similar to the early bumblebee in its fluffiness, but it's got a white tail. Smaller, rounder and longer hair than the garden bumblebee. And there are the males. Oh, I still can't get the shape of the face, but hopefully you can see that face isn't long like in the garden bumblebee. The garden bumblebee, you get a real sort of horsiness in profile. So yellow, yellow on the face in the male, and then one, two, three yellow bands. I have to say the diagram is incorrect here. I need to tell the trust because he should have a yellow, yellow tuft on his face, like this little chap. Okay. So that's the heath bumblebee. Lovely, lovely species. Um, before we go on, um, somebody asked about tree bumblebees and um, how they were introduced. Yeah, it was, as far as anybody knows, it was actually a natural colonisation. So they would have come over um, from the near continent, flown over the channel, um, from Belgium or France probably. Um, our bees do from time to time and then they spread out from there so it's quite like the oh there is some genetic studies actually I can't I can't remember what the outcome was on how um, you know they've, they've done some work on looking at um, like was it a single colonization or how, how it happened and I can't I actually can't quite remember the outcomes but um, yeah natural natural as far as we know we don't think they hopped over you know on a boat or in cargo or anything like that and they're not a species that is bought or bred commercially so yeah right okay so just for us to be mindful last bit of id now before we move on to field stuff and recording um, same as last week, just, just be mindful of these little critters, the cuckoos, well they're not little, the females are actually generally huge because they are um, fighters and they're evolved to take over the nest of the social species and kill or um, expel the host queen from the nest, so they're, they're quite fearsome, the females. Uh, no, no differentiation in caste, as I said, she doesn't produce workers. So quite a few of them are like this, quite dark looking without a second abdominal band, spindly hairy legs, as we said last week, often darkened wings. In one particular species, they're almost black. So if you see a bee with dark, very, very dark wings, you know, straight away, just 
just those kind of warning bells that you might have a cuckoo. Um, they're often less fluffy and less thickly covered in hair. So you can see the black shining through of the integument. Um, often very slow and uh, relatively short tongued. So just a little bit more detail. I'm not going to go through these. This isn't this app, sorry, this isn't a cuckoo training course because they they really can be quite difficult. But I've um, got the forest cuckoo, which is um, which attacks the nests of the early bumblebee. And uh, the females have just one yellow uh, band there and then a white tail. They're very, they're often very numerous in the earliest spring in about sort of April time, I would say. You can see them often on dandelions and things like that. The males are harder to identify, uh, but uh, have a very, very, very little tiny red tip to the tail, a bit like the early bumblebee. So they do tend to mimic their hosts. This one I've seen a lot in Pembrokeshire, the Southern Cuckoo Bombus Vestalis. You'd expect it to be in reasonable numbers because its host is so common, the buff tail. And again, yellow collar. They do have two yellow bands, but the second one is actually adjacent to the white. It kind of tops the white and there's a notch in it. Like that is a break, a clear break in the yellow band, which is really distinctive in cuckoos, in some cuckoos, I should say. Don't get, mm, well, actually, I won't say that. Uh, the red tail cuckoo, this is a bit of a tricksy one because the female looks exactly, almost exactly like her social counterpart and her host, the red tail bumblebee. So the red tail cuckoo has a red tail and all black in the female, but this is the one where the wings are almost black. So if you see what looks like a red tailed bumblebee with black wings um, and very spindly legs, you might well have Bombus rupestris. And they, um, they're big, <laughs> they're so impressive. They're amazing bees. Uh, males much harder. I've, I, they vary a lot. Some of them have yellow on them. I, I've never knowingly seen a male one. I have seen females, so uh, I won't dwell on those. They're, they're very difficult to ID. And Barbet's cuckoo bee um, is, attacks the nest of the garden bumblebee. So in the field, it appears very similar. You know, the garden bumblebee has has three stripes, if you remember, two on the thorax like that, and then a clear one on the abdomen. Well, this is similar, and it has hints of yellow on the abdomen, both males and females similar, but it doesn't have the long face of the garden bumblebee. Uh, but again, difficult one. Just be aware of them. Just be aware. So uh, gypsy cuckoo. Uh, I've not knowingly seen one of these in the field and they look quite similar to the southern cuckoo and they have a yellow band above the tail with a notch but it's not quite as obvious as on the southern cuckoo so quite a tricksy one that one and this one the camp, uh, field cuckoo bee Bombus campestris um, it attacks the nests of common carders, the gingery ones, and as such, it kind of appears a bit gingery in the field. I have seen males with these extensive yellowy gingery tails, but I've never knowingly seen a female, and I've never knowingly seen a melanic one either. So don't worry about those at all, but be aware, be aware as you go out. And if you get more into recording bumblebees, then you will start finding them and uh, wanting to identify them. And here's some bumbles that I've seen. So this is, uh, I've only learned the Latin names, Bombus sylvestris, which I think is a forest. Yeah, the forest cookie bee, this one. So yellow collar, white tail, yellow collar, white tail. And that's female and uh, typical there on the dandelion in the spring. 
and you can see her integument shining through there. Okay, and no pollen baskets, no wide back leg. This is Bombus vestalis with the yellow above the white of the tail. This one would have a notch if you could see it from the top. And I'm not 100% certain about this one. I think it is a male of um, this one, but I'm not 100% sure. So we're not going to dwell too much on that one. Um, the males are really difficult. Okay, so cuckoo bumblebees, just, just keep your eye out. It's quite fun when you find them because they are, they are really interesting and quite impressive bumblebees. Okay, so field kit. Now I know some of you are probably experienced recorders, some of you aren't at all. So um, start, you know, starting from that baseline, if you haven't been out recording insects before, everybody's will find their own level, I think. And for some people getting equipment, and catching bees isn't what they want to do, and that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, if you, if you just want to do it from photographs or from up from your using your eyes, you can record bumblebees. You can identify stuff, but there will be a limit. So you would get to a point where um, you want to, you know, where, where you can't record anymore, because for a lot of species, you do have to net them and pot them and have a look at them. And it doesn't harm the bumblebees, they're quite tough. As long as you release them quite quickly on the same spot that you caught them because they uh, have brilliant navigational abilities and they will want to go back to their nest. So don't, don't move them away from the spot that you find them. But uh, if you want to go on recording or set up a bee walk, then you will need some field equipment. Oops. Um, field bag. I just, I, I, this is my really, really pathetic little field bag. Some people have really, really smart ones. I just bought, I just bought um, a first aid kit bag. But the lovely thing about it, and all field bags is that they go across your body so you can have everything to the side of you. If you've got it all in a rucksack, it's an absolute pain because every time you see a bee, you know, you're trying to get a pot out or whatever. Um, and unless, unless you've got loads of pockets, you need a bag right on your hip so that you can get everything out. And in there, I have specimen pots, my phone with a camera, GPS, the recording app, you could also have your um, Bumblebee ID apps if you're an app fan or your Bumblebee ID book, which I'll show you in a minute, um, and your field notebook, whatever you use there, it's all to hand. Nets, I've got uh, different nets. I've got posh nets with telescopic handles and great big um, actual net bags on them. But this beginner's Bumblebee, uh, beginner's insect net from Watkins and Doncaster is perfectly adequate for bumblebees and I actually find them great. They're easy to use, they're lightweight, you can pop them in your rucksack with a stick, the handle coming out the top, um, you know, so yeah, fine. I do carry a rucksack as well, by the way, with my sandwiches and my drinking, so I do have a rucksack and a field bag. Hand lens again, cheap and cheerful is fine unless you like having the really posh one, but a times 10 is absolutely uh, perfect for bumblebees. Um, and again, these, these basic ones from Watkins and Doncaster, I find them absolutely fine. Uh, for, for containing the bees, I use a specimen pot with kitchen roll because um, it, you can gently uh, stop the bee buzzing around in the pot and get a really good look at it. Glass ones are the best, but I have actually sat on a glass um, specimen pot that was in my back pocket and that didn't end well. So just obviously be aware of that. Um, people also use these queen marker cages, which um, beekeepers use. I personally don't like using them for identification because I find the bees legs just get stuck in the netting and it really annoys me. And I, I don't like using them at all, but some people do. 
and it's another option. And all of these things can be got. Well, I, I like Watkins and Doncaster. They're great. They're really helpful online. Their catalog is brilliant. And uh, you can get these things quite reasonably priced. I think the net is about £12. The hand lens, is, hand lens is about nine quid um, and so on. So not, you know, not extortionate. So ID guides and further reading. This book um, is published by the Mubby Conservation Trust and written by some of my colleagues. It, it's a perfect beginner guide. It's really good. It's not too thick and it's got loads of lovely photographs. All the bees are separated by tail colour and it's got every UK bumblebee in it. Okay, so that's, and it's a tenner from Amazon and all usual outlets. All the money goes to Bumblebee Conservation Trust and you can get it on the website as well. Um, oh, I've, I've actually packed all my Bumblebee books in my um, field bag because I was out on the weekend. But this one, The Field Guide to Bumblebees uh, by Edwards and Jenna, I think it's just been reprinted. And this is a lovely little book to put in your um, field bag because it's small and it's handy and super simple to use. So that's a really nice one for taking out in the field. If you see bumblebees by Priest Jones and Corbett, it's heavy going folks. Um, no, that's in my field bag as well. I will, I probably personally wouldn't recommend that for beginners. It's got quite heavy scientific key. Uh, lots of information about bumblebees, lots of, information on their ecology but yeah not massively engaging perhaps this one is the opposite this is a lovely bumblebee coffee table book which is written by my manager Richard Common and um, yeah that's a lovely lovely sort of introduction to bumblebees so that's a nice one you can get that for about five or on eBay or Amazon it's uh, not very expensive at all so that's quite a nice general one and then there's Stephen Fawkes Field Guide to the Bees of Great Britain and Ireland, which is absolutely fantastic. But that has every UK bumblebee uh, bee species, including all 245 or so solitaries. So that is not for the faint hearted. And that also has quite a complex scientific key. So I would say if you're a complete beginner, go for Bumblebee Conservation Trust and or the Edwards and Jenner one um, with the RSPB one for your coffee table and perhaps um, Stephen Fork for those of you who are more experienced or wanting to look at solitaries as well, okay? And of course, these days, online resources are super important. Um, Bumblebee Conservation Trust website uh, has quite a lot on identification, so definitely have a look at that. We've also just launched our Common 8 Bumblebees app. So if you are a smartphone, iPhone, tablet sort of aficionado, do download that app. It's free. It's great. For each species, there's photographs, there's every test is described and you can compare um, to similar species so you can see you know what you could be confusing it with so do have a look at our app and download that and I would heartily recommend if you are on Facebook join the UK Bees, Wasps and Ants um, Facebook group it's headed up by some of the best experts in the country and it is so good for getting help with identifications so before you do any recording, before you start submitting your records, try to, to get your BID using some of these resources um, so that the verifiers, when you send in the records, many of whom are part of the bees, wasps and ants groups, the verifiers, um, you know, have got a fighting chance that you've made a correct ID. Uh, 
we you know they have a tough enough job really with with uh, verifying without id and stuff so lots of resources for identification and another one again online if you google stephen fork flicker stephen fork is probably one of the best entomologists and bees yeah there, there is nobody better probably um Stephen's Flickr pages have downloadable crib sheets for the common species on the cuckoos and the carders they're lovely photographic uh, prompt sheets if you like but also for every single UK species he has about 50 different photographs so that's a brilliant online resource so I would heartily recommend that. And now I'm gonna hand over to Elaine um, for the recording bit. So I'm just gonna check the chat to make sure that I've... Uh... Okay, yeah, I'm just gonna answer these couple of questions. Uh... Oh, can't manipulate the chat very easily. Monica, were you talking about the cuckoos when you said they all seem to have yellow faces? Can you can you just shout out for me? Uh, yes, it was because in the diagrams they all look a bit yellow. Let's have a look. Yeah, no, no, I think they're just a bit, if you meant these ones, um, can't remember what, yeah, no, they're, they're not, they're not actually, not the faces, is that all right, Monica, you can see they're actually sort of representing as grey black on these. I haven't seen many cuckoo males, I must admit, but um, I think it's just the four common bumblebee males that we've gone over that have the yellow faces. Um, yeah. I mean, that that's a cuckoo male there and his face is black. So I hope that answers that okay. Black tips on most tails. Chris, again, were you referring to the cuckoos there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They do. It's funny. It's like that very final, final segment is black. But in the field, that's not particularly obvious. So you would just be looking at these. The white tails are. So like if you look at this one, Chris, you can see you are looking at quite a white tail. But there's, you can see that black glass segment sometimes, like on that one, you just can there, and on that one, you just can. But it's not always obvious. And on some of the cuckoos, the tails are quite tucked under as well. So you don't get the visible of that, you don't get that very last segment visible. Um, is it just male cuckoos that have stings? Um, no male bees have stings, cat. It's only females that ever sting because the sting is evolved from um, their egg laying apparatus, if you like, from their reproductive system. So males just don't have the equipment. <laughs> they no male bees sting or wasps. Okay. Which is the lightest to carry, Rachel? Is this um is this the net, Rachel? Can you just shout out? Do you mean the net? I think it was the books we were on. Yeah. Uh, the books. Yeah, good. That makes sense. Yeah, Rachel, um, de definitely this one here. The um... Oh, hang on. Oh, 
Yeah, the, the one by Steve, I've got my box full of field stuff behind me, but it's all a mess where I dumped it on Saturday after my field. Stephen Falk's one is heavy and chunky, right? That's a big lump. This one, not too bad at all. It's about A5 in size. So there's an A4 sheet to compare. And it's quite light and thin. The one on the side there in the corner, the field guide, the one with the orange lines, field guide to the bumblebees um, in the top right, that is small and light. But I can't see it. <laughs> it's small and light. That's really small. It's about half, well, third of the size of that again. So that one will slip in your field bag, no problem. So for the field top two, okay? The app is um what's that bumblebee? Um Grant, I don't know if you can see this, but see that little blue square there? In the app store, that's the one you're looking for. It's called What's That Bumblebee? And when you click on it, you get Bumblebee Conservation Trust logo and your lovely promenade. So it's What's That Bumblebee? Hopefully that's all right. Uh, bleh. So Rachel's okay. Yeah, Monica, I would say black nearer than grey. I don't I don't think those um those images are that good. I think they're yeah, they look greyish in the images, but their faces are more towards black and definitely not yellow. I hope that helps. Ooh. Uh do you recommend the FSCA guides? Well, I do. I do, Jeff, but I'm not sure that there is there an aid gap to bumblebees. I know there's um I know that there's one of these to bumblebees, uh, to bees of Britain. I've got the ladybird one here one of these pull-out sheets. And I'd say, no, I, I love the Field Studies Council stuff. And this, this ladybird one is brilliant, but you can't try and cover bumblebees and solitary bees and honeybees in one of these. There's just too much scope for confusion. But I don't know if, um, Elaine, could you just Google if there's a, a gap guide to bumblebees which is more of a book in yeah which, I think there is but um in which case that might be okay but i've not seen it okay no it's not coming up i think um a gap I, more obscure groups yeah i i have i certainly um haven't seen it i've got a few a gap books myself and i've not seen it uh jeff and i think Having done this course, that using one of these fold out guides, you, you're already beyond that. Okay, so I wouldn't bother with that personally. Okay, and Grant, glad that's good. Right, let's, let's hand over to Elaine now. So this is submitting records, folks. Do, do, do. Apologies to everybody that knows already how to record. I know there's some really keen recorders on here, so um, just zone out for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so I'm going to briefly cover a few different aspects of recording. Um, so what actually is a record? I'll show you how to use the app and our online recording system. Um, briefly, some other routes you can use, and I'll show you a Darren as well. So, very basic beginner, just in case anyone doesn't know what a wildlife record actually is. Um, so, basically, you've seen a bee or anything at all, and you want to know how to turn your sighting into a record. And in order to do that, you just um, need four essential pieces of information. So, we need to know what we've seen, 
where it was seen, when it was seen and who it was seen by. So in this example here, I've got a lovely um, male white-tailed bumblebee um, seen in Coidili last year by me. So um, those four pieces of information are all that you need to make a record. Um, there are some additional bonus bits that you can add um, if you want to. So a photograph um, is very useful for bumblebees, certainly. Um, you can include information about gender and habitat, breeding behavior, anything at all. Elaine, sorry, yeah. I'm so sorry, Elaine, but your sound isn't very good. Oh, really? Yeah, it's really crackling. Have you got something over your mic? Let me just... Um... That, that might be better. Just gonna take my webcam out. That's better already, actually. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I always have trouble with sound. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, okay, great. that's okay now. Um, so, yeah, so you can add those extra bits if you want to, um, just to add to the record. So, First thing I'm going to show you how to use is the app. Um, so all of the recording systems I talk about today are part of the iRecord family. So iRecord is a national um, recording system. It comes in various forms, um, the national website, there's various apps, but all the data goes into the same pot and it's available to people like the record centers and also to those um, experts and verifiers for people like the B Wars group. So um, it basically gets to the people it needs to get to um, via iRecord. So you can get the app for free. Um, it's bilingual, so that's quite nice if you're a Welsh speaker. Um, um, it's available on Apple and Android. And hopefully this video will work for me um, to show you how to actually use it. So when you first um, download it and open it, it will look like this. So just a blank screen because uh, you haven't added anything yet. And to add your first record, you just click on the green circle at the bottom. And then behind the scenes of iRecord and all of the iterations of it, there is a species dictionary. So all the species in the UK are, are listed in this dictionary. So you can just start typing in a species name and hopefully you will find the one that you're looking for. So in this example, I'm putting in an ivy leaved um, toad flax from my garden. So you just start typing and you see it on the list and you can just click on it and it will be pulled through. There we go. Um, the another nice thing about the app is because it uses your phone's GPS, it will work out a grid reference for you if you let it. So you can just click allow if you're happy for that to happen. And then we can see here that we've got a draft record that we need to add some more information to. So you just click on that. always challenging to narrate a video so here we go so we've got um so we think about the what who what where and when we've got the what and part of the where so the next thing we need to do is to fill in the rest of the where so it's pulled out the grid reference from our gps on our phone and partly filled in the location for us so we just click on that to add the name which i hopefully will do now yes yeah, there we go and you can see here um, that it pulls the map for you, so you can just double check that you are where it thinks you are. Um, if you are in the wrong spot or you're recorded earlier and you want to um, move the map around, you can do that really easily. It's just like Google Maps or anything like that. You just sort of pull yourself around on the screen and uh, put a dot where you want to be. But assuming you're happy with where it is, you can just um, type in a location name. And this is just so that we know that your grid reference is correct. Um, <clears throat> and once you've done this one time, um, it will save the location name for you, so you won't have to keep typing it in every time. So there we go, that's my location name. And each time we want to, um, we're happy with the details, we click in the top left hand corner to go back to the other screen. So here we go. Then we look at the when. So it automatically assumes that you're recording today, but you can go into that and change it just by clicking on it. Then you just scroll these um, options to get to the date that you want. 
And again, we click up here to go back to the main screen. There we go. <laughs> there we go. And then the other bits are optional. So we can um, add some bits and pieces. So um, we can click on comment to just add any extra detail. So for bumblebees, it'd be really useful here if you say that it's a queen or you found a nest or um, anything that sort of distinguishes it from just a normal sighting. And it's just free format. You can type as much as you want in here. I didn't add anything for this boring plant. Um, then the next thing we can do is to add an abundance. So either a range, if you've counted your bumblebees, or you can be more precise and use these plus and minus buttons to give an exact number, or you can just leave it as present if you want to, which I did for this plant. And then the other things you can add are stage. So Oh, at different points, it will bring up this um, little um, tip so that you can just click on those OK to get rid of them. My video has stopped there. <laughs> Sorry, guys, my video should be a little bit longer, but I'll just. Um... No, it is longer. There we go. So the. Um... So you can put in sex as well and um, identifiers. So say, for example, you've emailed Claire and said, I don't know what this bee is. Can you tell me what it is? And she's told you what it is. Um, you would just add her name as an identifier because um, it just shows that someone else has helped you with the record, basically. Uh, and then the last thing you can do is to add a photograph. So again, you need to give it permission to um, look at your media. And then just navigate in your phone to where your pictures are. Okay, with my ivy leaved toad flax. So you just click on the picture and it will be pulled through into the record. It should appear down here. There we go. So we've got all the details there we want to add. So we just click at the top right to um, upload the, the record. And you might have noticed it doesn't ask you who actually recorded the record um, because in the app, it assumes that you are the person adding the, the has seen the species. So um, it just puts your name, basically. You don't have to put a name in. It briefly appears in the pending page just to um, go through the process of uploading. And then you can click over here into uploads. So say, for example, you're out in the field and there's no um, signal, it will hang around in the pending for a bit longer um, until you reach an area with signal. And sorry, that's restarted. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll um, go on to my next slide. There we go. I've never tried to use an embedded video before, and I think that showed it didn't really work. But basically, you've seen how it works. Um, it's very easy. You just fill in the different bits of detail. Um, I'm going to just show you again on our website. So say you've been out in the field and um, you want to You come home and you've got a big list of species you want to enter. It might be quicker to use the website to do that. So. This is what our website looks like. Um, again, you'll have to sign up for an account and things like that. If you want more details on that, you can find it on our um, YouTube guides, which I'll share with you afterwards. But just to enter a record, we click on record. I'll just show you a casual record. So it's asking you similar things to what the app does. So the when, you just click on it, it brings up the diary calendar rather. Record a name, you can change it on the um, website, I'll leave it as me. Again, the species dictionary is there, so you can just start typing in a species name. Hopefully it will come up, there we go. 
There are these optional bits, certainty, quantity, sex, life stage, identifier. If you want to add any of that detail, you can mark the record as sensitive. Probably doesn't apply for bees, but um, say you'd found a raptor nest or something and you didn't want other people to be able to find that information, you can just mark it as sensitive. Again, you can add a photograph and then we come to the location. So um, you can either search on the map for a location and it will pull you to where that location is. Or you can zoom in and out, um, a bit like on a Google map, basically, and just move yourself around till you find the place you want to be. And then you can just click anywhere. And once you've got that red square, that's the grid reference that it's pulled through for you. And again, we type in our location name. Um, you can save these. So once you've um, done it more than once, it will save the location for you and you can just pick from a, a drop down list basically. And again, you can add habitat details, um, add any comments like it's a queen or a nest or whatever. So there are a few other things you can do on Super Record, but I'm not gonna share them with you now because I don't wanna overload you with information. So let's go back to my presentation. And just to mention, there are a few other recording routes. So as I said, I record just the national version. Um, it's perfectly fine with us if you prefer to use that version. Um, the Super Record data just gets to us a little bit quicker, but um, we still get it on iRecord. And they have some nice apps as well on iRecord, um, like uh, species specific ones, like iRecord Grasshoppers, which has got a built-in species guide. Now, I don't think they've got one for bumblebees yet, but I'm, I'm sure there will be one eventually. Um, but if you don't fancy tangling with that sort of technology at all, it's perfectly fine to just email us a spreadsheet of records. Um, we can send you a template and you can just fill it in as and when and email it to us and we can get it in really quickly to our database. And the last thing I'm going to show you quickly is how to use the Derin. So back over to that one again. So the app and um, Oops. Yeah. So the app and to record and I record are how you get data to us, but the Adarin is how you can actually explore the data that we hold. So um, if you're ever curious about um, what species are found near you or where species are found in Wales, you can use Adarin to do that. So in the public section, there are two tools. So you can look at what's in my area and click on the map or just type in your grid reference, sorry, your um, postcode and click go. And this will give you a species list of all the data, um, all the species that have been recorded around your house, basically. So it looks at a one kilometer by one kilometer area and gives you a species list there. And um, the only thing this doesn't include is any sensitive species like um, birds of prey and bats that are subject to um, persecution or disturbance. Uh, we can't make that information public. Um, and then the other thing you can do is to do a distribution map. So say you've seen something and you're wondering how common or rare it is. I'll stick with my trusty marmalade hoverfly that I always um, demonstrate with this. Um, you can type in any species name here. And then get a map up to show you where it's found in Wales. So this can be really interesting if you're wondering, perhaps you found a bee and you think it might be quite rare. Um, you can have a look at a distribution map like this and see if it's found in your area or not. Mm -hmm. So back to that one and I've talked about quite a few different links um I'm not going to list them all for you but we do have a link tree so if you go to this web address it will give you links to everything I've talked about today and I will send them an email afterwards as well so back over to you Claire sorry about all those technical difficulties <laughs> No, oh, you're still muted, Claire. 
Yeah, I've been trying. Well, I've had a bit of a technical blip because I've been trying to answer people's things in the chat. Realised I've sent all my messages to Elaine, oh. <laughs> not to everyone. <laughs> so what I'm going to say um, is a couple of people have put down that they've already downloaded the Lurk and the um, Bumblebee apps, which is absolutely brilliant. Jeff. Uh, said he always uses i record um and yeah it's come it's jeff there's no difference if you put your records into i record carry on with that it'll all go to subrec anyway whether you use i record or lurk whales so that's fine can we see other people's records near our location oh i i yeah i i read that as can we use other people's records but can you see them yeah you can you can can't you Elaine in a Darren as far as well yes yeah, so on a Darren it's not the full detail it's just like a species list it doesn't have people's information but it'll say um what when it was last seen and how many records there are for example of a bumblebee um on Subacord you can explore other people's records um, but you can't really search in it, so it would just be sort of random. You can't look specifically for your area. Um, but if you were like, if you if a Darren doesn't do it for you and you need more information, then you can get in touch with us and we will try and um, get you more data if you need it. Okay, guys, I've just got one or two more slides and then it's quiz and bedtime, I think. Um, so yeah, so just like Elaine said, uh, I'll just share this. Elaine, can you see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, so recording bumblebees and submitting data, that's what our project is all about. And I, I know not everyone will record after this, but I hope some of you feel confident enough to either start or, or certainly to carry on and to start um, getting more bumblebee data into our Welsh database um, and as we said you know you can do that either by following what Elaine's just demonstrated and submitting into iRecord or into Subrec but the other thing is to set up a bee walk monitoring transect which is um, a little bit more of a commitment but very rewarding and this is our um, national citizen science scheme which provides critical abundance data about bumblebees i'm not going to go on about this now um i'll just quickly whiz through this but on i think the 23rd of june we are going to do an online zoom for setting up a bee walk transact and um this is where i could possibly come up to follow up with a demo with Elaine um, to show you how to do it in the field. So the survey is undertaken by volunteers like, like yourselves um, who identify and count bumblebees on an hour's walk once a month from March to October on a yearly basis. Anyone who's had basic ID training can become a bee walker. We do provide support. You just need a little bit of time each month to walk your fixed route, which remains the same route every month, and send us your sightings through our dedicated Bee Walk website, which is linked to iRecord. This information is really, really important because it helps us to monitor how bumblebees change through time and allows us to detect early warning signs of population declines which ad hoc recording doesn't do very effectively. Uh, so all the data is really, really important. And like I said, on the 23rd of June, uh, we will be running a session on Bee Walk. I'm gonna whisk through those because Elaine's already done it. Optional homework this week. <laughs> I can't chase you next week, but um, if you are coming along in June for the Bee Walk one, or if you're not, it doesn't matter, but suggested activities could be registering for, uh, online with Subrec or downloading the Lurk Wales app, which some of you have already done this evening, 
or if you are coming in June, have a think about if you'd like to set up a Bee Walk transept. You could do it with a friend or in a group if you're part of a volunteer group uh, or do it on your own. I did mine on my own and think about where you might like to do it. And you could bring that information with you to the uh, next session. Right, quiz. <laughs> We're going to whiz through now because it's time to finish. Um, just before we do the quiz, I'm going to check the chat to make sure everyone's happy. Okay, Elaine's posted some useful stuff. Uh, yeah, Grant, for the June one, don't worry, Elaine, we'll send the details out to you and you will be able to book on, um, we'll, we'll be sending out booking details with that email. Yes, uh, who's asked that? Hang on. Ah, can't see who's asked that question. Andrea, yeah, um, yeah. You can totally choose where your transept goes. So it could be like through your village or through a park or through a nature reserve or a triple SI, wherever there's access and is safe to do so, it's fine. We also have some transects that are currently not walked, which are already registered on our site. So we could uh, offer what you one of those, but basically it's up to you. As long as it's safe and accessible, that's fine. Do people mind if we ask for ID like on Facebook? Facebook, Hannah, best Facebook group is, I would say is definitely the Bee Wars group and also the information that Elaine's given out in the chat below. Uh, right. Can you do, does anyone cover the air in the Black Mountains? Grant, massive, massive lack of data in the Black Mountains. So, yeah, that'll be amazing. And I can give you some more support. We've got a dedicated, dedicated, <laughs> dedicated, oh God, designated Bee Walk officer. So, um, yeah, thanks for popping that up, Elaine. All good, all good, Grant. That would be brilliant. Um, and there's one. Yes, so Hannah. Oh, no, not Hannah. Sorry, I'm struggling to... Who's asked about forestry? I can't manage this chat very well. Annie, Andy. Me? Yes, Andy. Be we have a lot of forestry around here. Across yeah. Across the fields and then through some forestry for an hour. Y yes, Absolutely, you can. Any habitat is game for a bee walk. And sometimes, you know, people fall into the trap of, oh, well, I won't do it there because there are no bumblebees. And we don't want to make that assumption because maybe there are. And often on the edge of woodlands and forestry, there are really nice strips of habitat which are quite bee rich. But also, if there aren't any bees in the forestry, then we want to know about it. That is also important data. So the Bee Walk registration process goes into a lot of detail about your habitat. So we will be able to analyze that and use it in the research that we do using the data. You know, if we've got people walking through forestry with zero bumblebee records, that is important. So yes, all mm -hmm. habitat. But for your own interest, obviously, for yeah. anybody, <laughs> you want to go somewhere where there's some bees just because it's important for yeah. you to enjoy it. Sorry, guys, we'd love to set up a bee walk. Yeah. Holly, do you remember we talked about this when I was with Plant Life? So you are on my list. <laughs> so watch this space. Uh, come to the training and I can give you some support as well to set up with your volunteers so that's all good yes jeff we can and we're going to be doing some targeted recording activities some bumblebee squares of the month which i'm going to be working on with elaine so again once wales nature i know elaine's really busy with wales nature week now but it's top of my list for us to get some target squares for you okay Right, guys, I'm going to press on with a quiz because it's awfully late and I'm, I'm, I'm losing the plot and I'll, I'll turn into a pumpkin soon.
So, quiz. Put it in the chat if you know the answer. We'll start off with queens. Remember to look at tails and bands. All these are females, so all queens. You don't have to worry about sex. Okay, we're going to start with some easy ones. Pop in the chat what queen that is, please, if you know the answer. Oh, going up quick. Yeah, good, 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 good. Everyone's saying white tail. Brilliant. It is a white tail queen. Whoops, a daisy. Hang on. What about that one? That is a queen. What what does everyone think? Okay. Yep, going up fast. Common carder. Common carder. Yes, common card, a brilliant. So gingery thorax, lovely color. She's she's really bright. And then we've got that kind of mixed up abdomen with an overall gingerish hue to it. So that's good. What about that one? Queen, covered in pollen. Yeah, it's going up, the chat's going up quick. So she's got a, an off white bottom and lovely deep stripes, buff tail, buff tail, buff tail, buff tail, buff tail, brilliant. It is a buff tail queen. And a very easy one, and I promise you it's not the rare one, and it's not the cuckoo, so red tail, red tail, red tail. Yes. Red tail bumblebee, good. What about that little beauty? So it is a queen. She's got a little peachy bottom there. And then two lovely bright yellow stripes. One of the prettiest queen bumblebees, I think. Um, so far, I'll just give a minute for people who are doing it in their heads or a few seconds. I need to read more, that's fine, Grant. <laughs> I still make mistakes now, so don't worry about that. Okay, early bumblebee, that one. Sorry, I know, I know I'm whizzing through these because uh, some of you will take a little bit longer. It's like being in a class, isn't it? You, you get some people answering very quickly and others need a minute to, to think. So uh, apologies for zipping. I'll give this one a bit longer. So that one is a queen and we've got, look at her tail and then count the stripes. And then there's an extra clue there in the shape of the face. Hmm. Yeah, Sarah, indeed, it is a horse-faced bee. Yeah, and the chat, so everyone who's put in the chat has got it correct. So we've got a white bottom, white tail, and one, two, three yellow stripes, long, long horsey face. So that is a garden bumblebee, Bombus hortorum. Okay. Right, we're going to mix it up a bit now. So you've got to do the sex, uh, for want of a better phrase, and the species. So I will, I'm going to give people longer for people who are doing it in their heads. So I would do the sex of the bee first. So use your clues. Has it got pollen? Has it got pollen baskets? What are the antennae like? Do the sex first and then have a go at species. Yeah, don't worry, Rachel. I had mine and I didn't feel too good either. Right, two people have said male. Are you sure about that? Look at the back leg, what's it got? Yeah, 
it's got pollen so it's got to be a female apps and we know it's not a queen because we've done the queens i so that that's a clue i'll give you so if we look at the back leg she's actually got a pinky white pollen lump there on her pollen basket so it's definitely a female so it's a little worker yeah chris oops <laughs> and she's got a peachy bum and a yellow collar. So it's actually an early bumblebee worker. If it was a buff tail, she'd have a second yellow stripe. Okay. And if it was a buff tail worker, a tail would be white. But so many people mix those two up. So it's an early bumblebee worker. Little peachy bottom, one yellow stripe, missing her second yellow stripe. And she's got pollen. All right. Right, so try and sex this one first. So look at the antennae and have a look if there are hairs on the surface of that hind leg there. It was tricky, Chris. It was tricky. So have a look. So this one, it's got, it's one of our two red tailed species. And I can see hairs on the back leg in the, on the surface of the back leg. So it hasn't got a pollen basket. People are asking male red, long antennae quite extensively red tail and I can see yellow on the face. It's a male red tail, male red tail. If it was a male early cat, all right, easy to mistake those two, they're so similar, but a male early would have a big yellow band on the abdomen as well and it wouldn't have such a lot of red on the tail, okay? <laughs> well done, Richard. Oh, this is my bit of my nemesis. When I was starting out, I struggled with this, with the sex of this one and the species. So let's do, do the sex the bee first. Look at the antennae and look at the surface of that hind leg there, male. Yes, Andy. Yes, Richard. I can see hairs there. So the pollen basket is non-existent. And the antennae are really long and droopy. It's got a white tail, but there's a slight buffish yellow stripe there at the top and then two yellow. So male buff. Male buff. I'm sorry if I'm going for a bit quick. If some of you are thinking it's so hard to judge when you're not in the room with me, I can't see what you're doing. But yeah, male buff tail that one. Well done if you got it. Nearly done now. What about that one? So do the sex first, right? Always try and do the sex first, so to speak. Um, spindly, hairy back leg on that one. If it was female, these would be smooth and shiny on the surface. And the antennae are quite droopy. So I'm just gonna tell you that's a male. And a lot of people are saying male common carder, and it is bright ginger. And if you remember, our, the common card, as we saw before, had a lot more black on the abdomen. And the males often look like this when they come out. They often look really bright and fresh and very golden. So that's for quite a typical male carder. Oh, I'm not going to put you through this. It's too late. That's a trick one. It's a hoverfly. We're all too tired for that one. Right, we're done. 